Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Krikor and Clara Zohrab Information Center's first enrichment evening of spring 2021. Let me begin by first sharing an update from the Zohrab Center. As many of you are aware, Dr. Christopher Sheklian, director of Zohrab since September 2018, has begun a new position at Radboud University in the Netherlands as a postdoctoral researcher in connection with the Faculty of Philosophy, Theology, and Religious Studies ERC Research Project, Rewriting Global Orthodoxy. My name is Jesse Arlen, and I have been appointed Zohrab's interim director. I am currently a PhD candidate of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures at UCLA with a focus in Armenian studies who, Lord willing, will be finishing my dissertation and earning my PhD degree in June. And it's a pleasure for me in my new role to be resuming the Zohrab Center's Enrichment Evening Series with an hour devoted to the topic that has been at the forefront of our collective hearts and minds for the last six months. Since the beginning, really since the end of the 44-day war, one has been confronted with a seemingly limitless and at times mind-numbing amount of information and misinformation, news and fake news, videos, articles, tweets, stories, and sound bites, political analysis, opinion, and propaganda, arguments and counterarguments, diatribe, rants, and protests. It seems everyone is convinced of their version of events, their account of what went wrong and what should now be done about it. And many feel obliged to shout or scream that at anyone who will, or more commonly will not listen. Tonight, I invite everyone present to take a deep collective breath to calm your mind and quiet its interior dialogue and open up your heart and spirit. Let's consider the possibility that we may not have all the answers, that there may be something lacking in our approach, something off about our judgments, something hasty in our conclusions, that we may have something new to learn, and that we may learn that not just from political analysts and pundits, politicians and activists, generals and journalists, but from writers and poets. Here to lead us through a sober, thoughtful, and reflective hour on literary responses to the nagorno karabakh conflict is Arakel Minasyan, a graduate of University of Michigan's MA program in Russian, East European, and Eurasian studies who wrote his master's thesis on the nagorno karabakh conflict in contemporary Eastern Armenian literature. His area of academic expertise is contemporary Armenian literature and his article on a 2015 personal essay by Anna Davtian is forthcoming in the scholarly journal Etude Armenienne Contemporaine. Arakel is also a translator of both Western and Eastern Armenian. His talk tonight is entitled Voices from Inside the Wall, Two Contemporary Armenian Texts on the nagorno karabakh Conflict. And before I hand the floor over to Adaka, I just want to say that after the talk, there will be an opportunity for questions about 15 minutes or so. And if you have a question and um, you want to send it in even during the talk, you can do that by writing in the chat. And so just find me, me, the host, it'll say Krikor Zohrab, and you can submit your question anonymously there, and then I'll direct the questions at the end to Adako. And so without further ado, let's welcome Adako. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jesse, uh, for that introduction. Um, and thank you to everyone who's here today. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces, uh, which is very exciting. Uh, and I'm looking forward to having this discussion with everyone. Um, this is, of course, a very important and very current issue 
for all of us. Um, so uh, I'm sure we're gonna have a very stimulating discussion. And I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, and uh, you all see that. Jesse, do you wanna just? Yes, it's good. Okay, great. All right. So I'm sure I don't need to remind anyone here of how terrible the consequences of the latest fighting in nagorno karabakh or the Republic of Artsakh for the Armenians was. For the Armenians specifically, we saw the loss of land and thousands of soldiers, human rights abuses against prisoners of war and ordinary civilians, and now ongoing political tumult in Armenia. Where do we go from here? What can be done? Unfortunately, this talk will not present easy or practical solutions, nor specific policy. But I hope that by examining how Armenian writers have responded to the fighting over the past 30 years, we can at least begin to think creatively and critically about how to move forward. Now, as Jesse said, this talk is based on my master's thesis that I just completed at the University of Michigan. Um, on these, specifically on these two works of contemporary Armenian literature that respond to the Karabakh conflict, both of which were written before the fighting we saw this past year. And in fact, I actually submitted this thesis uh, only, I think, a few weeks before the fighting uh, started. I embarked on this research because it seemed to me that at least at the time I began writing this thesis, there were little to no prospects for resolution of the, con of the conflict. Young conscripts had been manning these trenches now through generations, staring each other down um, on staring each other down on the whole length of the line of contact in Kharapakh. There were, of course, regular skirmishes, but the map of the battlefield had not altered in a significant way since the first war ended with Armenian victory in 1994. Armenia was to a certain extent satisfied with the status quo, while Azerbaijan bided its time, building up a stock of modern military technologies that we saw used so often in the fighting this past year. It also seemed that Armenians and Azerbaijanis inhabited vastly different worlds with regards to how they saw the conflict, a vastly different set of facts and completely different stories about who was the victim in the fighting. Armenians emphasized the pogroms of Armenians in Baku and Sumgait and their expulsion from these and other places in Soviet Azerbaijan as well as the ever-present memory of the 1915 Armenian genocide and the fear that it understandably implied. Azerbaijanis, on the other hand, focused on how their civilians were expelled from Karapakh, the territories surrounding it, and from Soviet Armenia. They also emphasized the massacres of Azerbaijanis in places like Khojali. Speaking very generally, neither story accepted any elements of the other, and the two peoples remained in this period in separate camps with little to no dialogue, making any attempts at peace and reconciliation between peoples who had only years earlier lived side by side, extremely difficult, if not impossible. It was in this context that I began looking at contemporary Armenian literary pieces on the Gharapah conflict. I wanted to know how these texts related to the conflict. Were they the same story we had heard before, or did they try to any extent to find a new narrative? a new story that included the opposing narrative in any way and tried to call for peace and dialogue. Now, it turned out that there were many Armenian texts written about the conflict, some as close to the fighting as the works of Levon Khechoyan written in the 1990s. And Khechoyan was an author who actually participated in the fighting. But I chose to examine two works in particular that looked at the conflict from the perspective of a younger generation, a generation that had primarily come to adulthood after the war and lived through these decades of what people call frozen conflict. And these are Hampartsum, Hampartsumian's 2010 short story, Yerguzhan, which means two hours, and Garin Garslian's 2016 experimental book, Aderazma, the Bakrain film, Aderazma, typographic film. And these two texts are just such works that ask their readers to critically examine how they, how they see the conflict and the Azerbaijani on the other side. Instead of focusing on the glories of war, instead of romanticizing it, they emphasize its realities on the front lines. And instead of emphasizing a picture of constant enmity, enmity between Armenians and Azerbaijanis, they try to focus on how this war affects soldiers 
on both sides of the line of contact. And before I dive in here, I just wanna reiterate that uh, this thesis was written before the war that we saw in September to November, 2020. Um, and to what extent these observations still apply today, I think is a topic that's, is a question that's worthy of discussion. And I hope we can talk about it in the Q and A. Uh, but personally, I do believe these texts are still important. And I hope that they can be a springboard for us all to imagine new futures in this new context. And uh, the first text I'm gonna discuss is Hampartsum Hampartsumian's uh, 2010 short story, Yergu Jam, uh, Two Hours. And this story was initially published actually on the author's blog before being picked up by the literary site Granish, uh, based in Yerevan. Uh, and this is a picture here of the text as it appears on the website. This is the author, Kampar Tsumyan. And actually, interestingly enough, if you look over here, uh, I only noticed after I took this screenshot that there's now a collection of new stories on the latest fighting we just saw on Granish um, over here. This one specifically is about the fighting in Jabrail. Yergusham tells the story of an Armenian conscript. Uh, and remember in Armenia, there's mandatory military service for men aged 18 to 27. And this conscript is serving out his two hour shift on guard duty. During that time, the narrator reflects on the suicide of a soldier named Vartan, who took his own life while also on guard duty. While having these reflections, the narrator becomes obsessed himself with the idea of his own suicide. And the story actually opens with him placing the barrel of his rifle between his lips, but unable to pull the trigger. As the story goes on and the narrator reflects on Vartan's suicide, we learn that the army has come in to investigate the death and that the soldiers and commanders there on that part of the front, rather than feeling sorry for Vartan, actually blame him for the scrutiny they're now facing and for rattling the status quo. The narrator, on the other hand, comes by the end of the story to a pitying understanding about Vartan, recognizing that Vartan was lonely and that the conditions on the front, the incessant waiting for his two-year service to end, pushed him to the edge, and that the other soldiers let him slip through the cracks. The story, in fact, is full of these moments of sitting around and waiting, mirroring the conflict that at that time was still stagnant and full of this kind of waiting on both sides of the line of contact. Now, there are many ways to read this story, uh, which I address in the thesis, uh, including as a critique of military leadership and reverence of the military within society. However, what I want to emphasize here is that this text was very much born out of this time of stagnant conflict and waiting, where young soldiers, many born after the first Gharapav war even ended, manned the line of contact, staring down their Azerbaijani counterparts. The enemy here, is not necessarily the Azerbaijani soldier on the other side of the line, but this constant slow waiting for this conflict to somehow be resolved. And in fact, in this story, the Azerbaijani soldier on the other side is seen as someone who is also a victim of this waiting and stagnation and someone with whom the Armenian guards interact. Towards the end of the story, when the narrator cannot figure out how much time is left in his watch, he instead thinks about how the Azerbaijani soldier on the other side is also sitting there and waiting for his watch to end. He reflects even that were his commander not there that day, he would normally call out in Russian to ask for the time. And this is the quotation I'm talking about. I, I'm not gonna read it out, but uh, just in case anybody wants to check it out. Um, and Russian of course is the common language spoken by Armenians and Azerbaijanis and a remnant of the Soviet period where these two peoples were co-citizens in the same country and in many places, neighbors, co-villagers and so on. So here, Hambartsumian draws a parallel between the stagnant waiting and loneliness that the narrator is facing on his watch and that faced by the guard on the opposite side of the line of contact, emphasizing that in this case, the Armenian and Azerbaijani soldiers are experiencing the same suffering at least in this aspect of the conflict. Moreover, by emphasizing that these two soldiers can speak together in Russian and in fact do that, Hampar Tsumyan emphasizes the place of a common period in Armenian and Azerbaijani history where they were both member states of the Soviet Union. By doing these two things, 
by emphasizing a parallel waiting and suffering among the guards on both sides and emphasizing the two people's shared history as part of the Soviet Union, Kampartsumian thus invites his readers to look to what is common between these two peoples rather than what is different, to break out of an image of perpetual enmity of us versus them, but rather to look at how this war is affecting both parties. And I will go a step further to say that that can be a way of finding some kind of common ground as a first step towards dialogue and peace. And the next piece that I'm gonna talk about, um, and I apologize for doing Hampartsumians so briefly, but the, the next text is just very rich uh, and very big. So I wanted to give it some more time. Uh, but Garen Harslian's uh, book is called Aderazma, the Bakrain film. And it was a book written in two, 2016, well, published in 2016. Uh, so Harslian is himself an Armenian from the Republic of Armenia, who actually emigrated to the United States. And he wrote this book during the surge in hostilities between Armenia and Azerbaijan in April 2016, out of a deep frustration that this conflict was still going on with no prospects for being resolved. And I want to show you all a picture of Raslian's book, just to give you a sense of how big and rich this is and um, how different from any uh, sort of other piece of Armenian literature. Um, and the word aderazma is actually an invented word. It means it's hate war, it is hate war. Um, and I won't go into how Harslian invented that now, but if anybody's interested, it's very interesting. Um, and so I would be happy to talk about it in the Q&A. And Harslian's text is not a traditional work of literature as you can probably guess. Uh, in fact, he calls it a Dubakrain film, a typographic film. And it's made up of elements of literature, graphic novel, film, and so forth. And just to give you a sense, this is one of the pages from Aderazma, which I won't be analyzing, uh, but you can see how there is this wall created by the, Ar by the Armenian word for wall, bud, kind of laid out in bricks. Uh, and it's actually upside down, so you may not be able to read it. Um, and it's overlaid here with uh, these Armenian letters in Tuchnakir, which we see in manuscripts. Um, and like I said, I'm not gonna analyze this page, but I just wanna give you a sense of the kind of book that this is and the kinds of things that are in this. Um, and it's also worth saying here that Garen has actually given a number of talks on this book, including one at a scholarly conference uh, in, at Cumbria University in Portugal, um, and one at the Zankag bookstore in Yerevan, uh, which I attended. And that's actually where I became familiar with this book uh, and I learned about it. And his presentations are, are really, really interesting. Um, and I think add a lot to anyone's understanding of the text. Um, and he has posted them on YouTube. So if anybody's interested in uh, looking more at the details that I'm not gonna be able to look at, I would actually uh, highly recommend that you check that out. Um, you can look up the title on YouTube. Um, and at his presentations, Garcian explains that he's explicitly writing against the contemporary relevance of calls to militarized national action. He discusses these two quotations from the late 19th century Armenian author Rafi's 1881 novel, Khenta, the Fool. This novel and its author Rafi hold a very important place in Armenian history and in the Armenian literary canon. And Rafi's books at the time served as calls to action against oppression under Ottoman rule. Garcian pushes back, however, against the contemporary relevance of quotations such as these that emphasize the importance of strength of arms and of being able to hate. He rather turns to a wide range of international sources, including many based in the Soviet period to build his critique of war. And this is something I'm not gonna discuss in detail here, but I want to emphasize from the start that Garcian's reference to Soviet sources in building his critique of war like we saw in Hampartsumian's story, uh, points to a period in Armenian history where Armenians and Azerbaijanis lived side by side, of course, not in a perfect union devoid of conflict, but by evo evoking this period in this way, Garcian centers histories of cohabitation between these two peoples in opposition to enmity. And there are two elements of this book that I want to discuss in particular. Uh, the first is 
uh, how Garcian talks about the relationship between war and language uh, and discusses how the continuing context of the Garapag war actually limits the language with which people are able to speak about the war and with the other side. And second, I'm gonna talk about how at the end of his book, Garcian invites his readers to physically engage with the continuing context of war and find an opening towards dialogue with the other side. So I'm gonna begin here with uh, Garcian's um, look at war and the constraints it poses on language. And a significant portion of Garcian's book, especially the first chapter, is based on Soviet Armenian filmmaker Sergei Parajanov's 1984 Georgian film, The Legend of the Surami Fortress, which uh, there is a still of here. This film is itself based on a Georgian novella by Daniel Chonkadze, which to put the plot very, very briefly, depicts a young man named Zurab, who is unwillingly forcibly immured into the wall of Surami Fortress to defend it from the invading Turks. And by immured, I mean cemented in physically into the wall. Now, interestingly enough, the ending in Parajanov's film actually differs considerably from the original by Daniel Chonkadze, because in Parajanov's film, Zurab willingly immures himself in the wall. So Parajanov gives the story a more kind of patriotic meaning, whereas the original is actually more of a tragic story. Uh, but Garcian says very explicitly in his book that the story he is referring to is the original, where Zurab is forced into the wall. And this is significant because for Garcian, Zurab symbolizes these soldiers forced to man the front lines in the contemporary Garapag war. So he's emphasizing that these soldiers are unwilling sacrifices in this, conf in this conflict. Rather than being immured in a cement wall, the modern day Zurabs in Garcian's book are immured in these trenches on the line of contact. And the trench, this wall in Adirazma, is here represented um, by an actual wall that we saw before, made up of the Armenian word for wall, for wall, uh, bud, as you can see here. Now, in the original story of Zurab, the part of the wall where Zurab is cemented in remains constantly wet from his tears. Garcian reinterprets that in this context to say that instead of tears, these soldiers call out faintly uh, the words that he shows here, which are behind the wall and are stuck in it, just as these soldiers are stuck in the wall and in the trenches on the line of contact. So the soldier begins by crying out words associated with freedom and love, such as this here, azad, free free field, free garden, free clouds. And I'm not gonna read all of these, but just to give you all a sense, um, this is how it progresses. So then these words try to break free of the wall and the context of war, and they bang against it to try to get out. And that's what we see here. So this is actually from his presentation in Portugal. That's why he's translated it into English here. But you see again, these words that the soldier is trying to say are trying to get out of the wall and they're banging against it. And one of those words that we saw was flock of birds in Armenian, yeram, here. And so now the flock of birds, at least in this page, try to get out of the wall as well and bang against it. And I'm actually gonna read this one here because um, it's, the alliteration is, is very interesting. The sound that it makes when I read it, it basically sounds like somebody is trying to bang against the wall, trying to get out. So again, you really kind of get that, when you read it out loud, you really get that physical sense of this soldier is trying to get out of here. On the next page, Garcian then represents that flock of birds trying to escape as a real flock of birds that hits against the wall and is splayed out against it, not being able to escape from it. And not being able to escape from it, it hits the wall and falls to the ground in the page that we see here. I think, no, sorry. Um, so then what we see after that is that instead of calling out those words associated with freedom and love that we saw before, 
the soldier starts to cry out words associated with hate or violence or war. So we see here, battle of walls, hate battle. I hate master, I hate God, I hate walls. And then after that, we actually see one page that just says in a string, ade, 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 hate, 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 hate. And so there's a few different things happening here. And actually just to recap, so the soldier immured in the wall starts by crying out words associated with freedom. Those words then try to escape from the wall, but they bang against it, they're unsuccessful, fall to the ground. And after that, the soldier can only say these words and phrases associated with war and hatred. And so there's a few different things happening here with regards to war and the Gharapar war in particular. First, Gharsian points to what war does to language and our abilities to speak with one another and by extension to have dialogue with the other side. Although the soldier immured in the wall begins by crying out words of freedom and love, by the end, he is consumed by hatred and anger. And this is one of the ways in which war constrains and shifts language. It centers and perpetuates a dialogue of antagonism, enmity, and hatred. Now, the second important thing to notice here is that all of these words that Garcian puts in here are actually words made up of the letters that spell the Armenian word for war, paderaz. So for example, you know, here we've got the a, ah, z, t, p, for, for those who know Armenian. So the, all of these words and phrases are only made up of letters uh, that come from the word war, paderaz. And what that does is it further emphasizes how war limits language, because the only things these soldiers in this chapter can say are made up of words that come from the word war and are thus limited by the context of war. And these limitations echo what we see among Armenian and Azerbaijani societies. As war continues, the context of Armenian-Azerbaijani dialogue it creates becomes limited to the context of war, anger, and hatred, making it difficult to begin any kind of dialogue. And that is the, at least in my analysis, the essence of this part of Garstian's book. Now, he actually takes this a step further um, by talking about how war all, also limits um, the, the song by, uh, uh, transcribed by Gomidas Garuna, a very important Armenian folk song, uh, which I don't have time to go into here, but just in case anybody's interested in that, I want to put it up so that we could talk about it in the Q&A. Okay, so the second part that I want to talk about of this book is uh, the very end of it, where which actually Garslian calls Chinchavadz um, Desarande, deleted scenes. And he explains in one of his um, presentations that that is supposed to, to mean that the things in this part of the book are impossible things. Um, and I'm going to come back to what that means at the end here. But it begins with this quotation that appears in Parajanov's film. And remember that the film has a more patriotic meaning uh, or ending than the original. Uh, and so this quotation appears in that film. If there is in a country someone who is capable of immuring himself in the wall of a fortress, that country and its people are invincible. So again, right, emphasizing how important it is for young conscripts to be immured on the lines of contact uh, to keep the nation invincible. So that text in the book appears against a white backdrop. And on the next page, we see that wall again in Armenian, but. Now, interestingly enough, on the very same page, but on the reverse side, Garcian places the same wall, but in Azerbaijani. And he places the same quotation in Azerbaijani as well. So it's worth, it's worth noting here that Garcian is showing these two sides as mirrors. Each is plagued by the same wall and the same concept that these soldiers need to be immured in these trenches. And these quotations only differ in the language in which they are written. Um, something else that I wanna note is that Garcian actually got um, an Azerbaijani author named Alek Per Aliyev to translate this into Azerbaijani. Uh, and Aliyev is a very controversial author in Azerbaijan. 
uh, because he wrote a, uh, a gay romance story between an Armenian and an Azerbaijani. Uh, so he was immediately ostracized. And I think he lives in, uh, now in exile in Switzerland. Um, but the interesting thing there is that Harslian is talking about you know, finding a new way of creating dialogue. And he's actually doing that work himself in the production of this book in creating it, which I thought was very interesting. Okay, now the next page actually shows the very same quotation, but now rearranged into the figure of Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. And the words themselves are also rearranged and changed by Garslian to now read, if a country is capable of liberating the person immured in the wall of a fortress, that country and that people are invincible. So rather than the country that can immure the soldier into the wall being invincible, now he's saying the country that can free the soldier from the trenches is the country that is invincible. And the same text is there in Azerbaijani as well. And I'm not sure if you can see it here, but there's actually a little picture of scissors on the person where Haslian invites his readers to cut this person physically uh, out of the page. Uh, and this person represents, uh, in this case, the Armenian and Azerbaijani soldiers stuck in these trenches, stuck in this wall. In fact, during both his presentations at Combia University in Erevan, Garcian physically performs this liberation for us, slowly cutting the human person out of the wall before our eyes. Cutting the person out of the wall creates what Garcian calls Hai Azerbaijanagan Yer Khosutian Baduhan, the window of Armenian-Azerbaijani dialogue. The person is liberated when they're cut out of the wall and the space they occupied leaves an open window through which both sides can at last see each other and speak. Garcian Zurab is now free and the boring of the wall further opens possibilities for engaging with the other in place of constant division. If the possibilities for dialogue are limited by the context of war, if the language with which one is able to speak is limited by that context, then by removing oneself from that context, figuratively taking the person out of the wall, new avenues for discussion become possible. Moreover, by asking readers to physically cut the person out themselves with scissors, Garcian is telling his readers that this is a problem that concerns them directly. He invites readers to question how they themselves relate to the Karabakh conflict, to the Armenian and Azerbaijani soldiers on the line of contact, and to the Azerbaijani population living on the other side of the border. Garcian invites readers to find another way within themselves of relating to the, um, to the notion of war and antagonism, and rather to open themselves up to a new language of engagement. This is not a simple task, neither emotionally nor physically. And I remember sitting at the Yerevan presentation and watching Garcian begin cut, cutting the man out of the wall. We sat there for over five minutes in near silence watching him struggle with small scissors, rearranging the book in different ways to follow the outline of the Vitruvian man. At times he sighed, visibly frustrated with the, how slow the process was. And we could see him fumble around with the book as he tried to speed up as much as possible. At one point, Rastian even said to us, durskal, he doesn't want to come out. At his presentation at Cumbria University, he says, liberation is not an easy task. And this seems to be the very point of Garcian's performance and this segment of the book. Aderazma invites us to fumble around with the page, to struggle with it, to try and fail, but to be patient until we are finally able to take the man out of the wall to engage in that process of self-liberation in order to finally come to a new way of seeing and speaking. Moreover, Garcian recognizes that removing the person from the wall is not the end of the story. He says in one of his presentations, you can take the human out of the wall, but it's hard to take the wall out of the human, meaning that the words wall remain imprinted on this figure when it is cut out. Garcian says this in passing, but I believe it is indicative of how complicated the process of peace and reconciliation are. You can try to create people but it is understandable why this has been so difficult over time. The person is imprinted with the experience of war. You can create the conditions for peace and understanding, but it takes a much longer time 
generations most likely, or who is to say that it will ever be possible to fully remove the experience of war and the way of relating with the other that it creates. But nonetheless, Garcen seems to be inviting his readers to take these first steps towards that process. Finally, it's worthwhile to return to the placing of, the seg of this segment of the book, which as I said at the start is in this um, section called deleted scenes, which Garstian calls impossible things. And on the surface, Garstian seems to be saying that this sort of reconciliation is in the realm of the impossible and can only exist on the page alone. But I don't think that that is the end of the story. During his presentation in Yerevan, when someone in the audience asked him if it was possible to just cut the person out in your mind, Garcian responded that of course it is possible, but until now all of this was in the mind alone. You have to put it into action. And this is indicative of what the text is trying to show and invite readers to do. Yes, the idea of reconciliation and national cooperation rather than antagonism seems in the realm of the impossible and may even be so now, but by beginning active steps towards reconciliation, by beginning to find alternate ways of engaging with the other side and with one's own notions of the conflict in the military, that kind of change becomes more possible, more and more real, and could possibly one day not exist in the mind alone, but become in fact a reality. Now, what does this mean? And by that, I mean, I wanna conclude with what I see are some practical uh, possibilities arising from what these texts invite us to do. They are not asking for Armenians to throw down their guards, to turn the other cheek or blindly accept conditions imposed on them from above or from outside. What they ask readers to do, it seems to me, is to begin a process of reevaluating how they see the conflict and the other side, to critically examine the history of the conflict and the way of relating to the other that it has created and enhanced. They ask readers to look for new stories of the conflict stories that incorporate both parties. And in the case of these two texts, those stories are based in the suffering these young conscripts face generations on, as well as the shared history of these two peoples as part of the Soviet Union. Moreover, Garcian's text specifically invites readers to find an opening, a window of dialogue with ordinary Azerbaijanis on the other side of the border. In my estimation, what this looks like is a project of grassroots dialogue between citizens on both sides of the line, um, working towards finding some kind of common ground. A narrative like this is not likely to come from the top, especially in Azerbaijan, where Ilham Aliyev's regime benefits far too much by exploiting the suffering of his civilians and young soldiers to hang on to power. And that is why it is imperative to have grassroots dialogue that cuts through this master narrative and offers an alternative. The history of Armenian-Azerbaijani relations is full of moments of hatred and dehumanization. The way we have seen prisoners of war treated in the aftermath of the latest fighting is an indication of that. Nonetheless, there are possibilities for this kind of grassroots dialogue. In May 2020, for example, we saw the release of a documentary film called Parts of a Circle, which was produced by a mixed Armenian-Azerbaijani team of veteran journalists and activists, including Tatul Hagopian, a really prominent Armenian journalist I'm sure many people here know. And that film deals with extremely sensitive subjects, such as the pogrom of Armenians in Sumgait and the massacre of Azerbaijanis in Khojali. At times, the Armenians and Azerbaijanis working on the project found themselves at extreme odds over the events, but compromised over time accepting harsh realities about their own sides while also listening to the stories of the other. The product is an extremely powerful film that can be acceptable to both sides, neither of which has a monopoly on suffering. Another example is the work being done by Peace Dialogue NGO based in Vanazor, Armenia, and where I had the pleasure of volunteering in 2018. Between 2015 and 2018, Peace Dialogue conducted an annual peace building mission a summer school for civil society groups in Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Russia, and Ukraine. And their work has gone a long way towards shifting some attitudes in all of these countries. Now, the latest fighting in Gharapagh has of course changed these dynamics to a great degree. To be sure there was terrible suffering on both sides, 
but the greatest loss, I think it's safe to say, was among the Armenians. In the midst of such an uneven contest, it is hard even for me to look back at these texts and talk about, about um, equal suffering. Yet still, we must recognize that throughout the entirety of this conflict, there has been terrible suffering on both sides. During the first war, we did see thousands of Azerbaijani civilians displaced, just as we saw Armenians displaced from places like Baku and Sumgai, and just as we're seeing Armenians displaced now from places like Hadrut and Kelja. And throughout this conflict, we have seen soldiers murdered either by conditions on their own fronts or through crossfire and skirmishes. Suffering is still suffering. And if the conflict is not resolved through some kind of dialogue that incorporates the societies of both countries, who is to say that soldiers will not man the front once more for another 30 years with new borders? And who is to say that that will not double into terrible war once more? Thank you very much. Thank you, Arakel, so much for this talk. It's it's such a difficult topic to approach from any angle. It's doubly difficult when you're trying to offer a perspective that is not the dominant narrative of a community or nation. And you've done a great job of leading us through these texts. Like you said, we don't get easy answers at the end of it, but it's important to think and reflect. And uh, to do that through uh, literature can be particularly meaningful. Um, I'd like to invite um, anyone who has a question to submit it into the chat. You can do that by writing uh, directly to me, the Krikor Zohrab host account. Um, I want to start off just by uh, asking you, Arakel. So yeah. one thing that was striking is you mentioned that both of these writers um, grew up in a situation that was already post the 1994 uh, end of war. And so they didn't personally experience the um, shared life together, let's yeah. say under Soviet times and um, uh, living side by side as neighbors of a sort. And yet um, both of them in their texts draw on that Soviet past to try to look to a potential perhaps for um, common ground. And in particular, it, it seems like particularly the case of a stalemate situation mm -hmm. of, of, of soldiers on both sides where it's easier to see the common ground because uh, if you grow up in a stalemate sort of situation and, and you're kind of stuck both manning the sides, um, there's a lot of commonality there. Um, and they're trying to promote dialogue or, or common ground through the shared suffering of the soldiers. And as you alluded to in the talk, the situation has changed dramatically and the balance has totally shifted. Yeah. And so I know this is a hard question, but I know you've thought about it, but it's just, how, does, how do you think the approach, how, how do you think the message changes after the, the war, the 44 day war. What, yeah. what might these writers say now or what, you know, that's my initial question. Yeah, um, that's a very good question. Um, and like you said, a very difficult one. Um, and I think if, I mean, if I'm speaking from my own perspective, I might put it this way, that the, if there is gonna be a new narrative created post what we've seen now, it needs to include the uneven nature of what we saw now. Um, and so that will be very hard, you know, in any kind of dialogue to convince the other side of. Um, but I do think that that would have to be part of the narrative while also, you know, recognizing that the other parts um, or the part about shared suffering still does exist to a certain extent, you know, in terms of the fact that, I mean, Azerbaijanis also saw losses, not losses as great as uh, the Armenians, but that can be a starting point. Uh, but I do think 
that, I mean, any narrative would have to now include uh, what has happened now. And I think that also goes for um, land as well, you know, because now, before it was the Armenians who had territories uh, surrounding Gharapakh, and now it's the Azeris who have territories within Gharapakh. And so, and I mean, I think I already read somewhere that um, there's talk of, you know, getting rid of the Armenian, the traces of Armenians in those areas. And so I think if there is going to be any kind of new narrative, it will need to include, um, yeah, what has happened now. Yes, yeah, that makes good sense. Um, there's a question that mm -hmm. just came in. So um, the questioner says, I'm very interested in the anti-war themes that both authors explore mm -hmm. by juxtaposing the shared experiences of Armenian and Azerbaijan yeah. conscript soldiers. So the question is, but are the perspectives or memories of volunteer soldiers present in the narratives of either? Oh. That's a very good question. Um, not, not in these two texts, um, at least not explicitly, um, but I, I'm trying to think if I know any off the top of my head. There are, uh, as I said, there are a lot of texts written about, um, about the war, uh, many coming you know, right after the, the original, the 1992 to 94 war. Um, and I would I would assume that there are perspectives like that in the in those ones. Um, I haven't seen any yet for more contemporary things, but um, it's a very good question. Another way maybe of asking the question too is, did either author serve in the war as as a soldier? I think um, that's a good question. What I thought was, did Ham Partum Habartumian? It sounds like maybe he did. Or? I think Ham Partumian did. I don't. I to be honest, I don't know for sure. Um, but I'm quite sure that Hambartumian did. Um, I'm not sure if Ghaslian left Armenia before uh, or if he did serve at all. I, I'm really not sure. There certainly are books and texts by soldiers who have served, like you mentioned, the Levon Yeah, Khachoyan. exactly. Levon Khachoyans is one. Um, and there, there are actually, there are many um, in, I mean, mostly written, actually all written in Eastern Armenian, of course. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's great that you've also done the work for those who aren't able to read Armenian to kind of like present something of of what's out there that is being written that otherwise some of us maybe don't have access to. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to I we can open um, the floor to audience uh, participation or discussion. So if you see on the bottom of your screen, there's the reactions, and you can either do like a raise hand feature or any of the reaction things and I can look, um, or you can just unmute yourself to um, ask a question. Um, in the meantime, there, there's a question, it's not related to the subject mm -hmm. of the talk, but it's obviously everyone comes with concerns. And so mm -hmm. I'm sure this is a concern shared by many. And if you wanna mm -hmm. speak to this in some way you can. So sure. um, how, what can we do about misinformation spread about the war? For example, like in the recent the recent Jeopardy question about uh, the country that's trying to take Nagorno-Karabakh from Azerbaijan um, and the answer is Armenia. And, yeah. you know, there's, um, Azerbaijan is pouring tons of money to spreading these, um, you know, yeah. their perspectives into Western media, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. What kind of things can we do to deal with instances of misinformation? Yeah. Um, so in terms of um, that's, a, that's a really good question, which is, it's kind of outside my expertise, but I think I can offer something. Um, but what I would say is, I mean, in Western media, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. Uh, but I think actually what's more, well, I, I don't want to say more important, but it's very important, I think, is, um, is making sure that, you know, like, if there's disinformation coming from the top, for example, in Azerbaijan, um, that that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about when I mean building these new narratives, like um, trying to build grassroots dialogue, I think will help um, maybe cut through, you know, like the dominant narratives uh, that are coming out from the top. So like we know, for example, that the 
um, the, the massacre uh, at Khojali, you know, the Azerbaijani government calls it genocide, for example, which, which it was not. Um, and so, and, you know, that kind of narrative is fed to people from the start. Um, and so what I'm, what I think these texts are trying to do is, you know, get us to get like the two peoples themselves um, to, to kind of create these new narratives together so that we can counter um, the, the false narratives that are used just, you know, to maintain power. Um, yeah, in terms of the Western media, though, I, I'm really not sure. Um, yeah. I... Yeah. Well, if anyone has another question, they can um, use the raise hand feature or unmute themselves to, to ask. Yes, go ahead, Armen Abkarian. Uh, hi, thanks. Uh, thanks again, Arakel, for uh, the wonderful talk. So uh, I guess uh, now would be an okay time to ask you to expand on the title uh, <laughs> Adir a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Armen. Um, so Adir Azma um, actually comes from, so uh, maybe I should open the slideshow actually so I can show you. Um, So Adirazm is um, comes from the word Badirazm, war, and so what oh, what Garstian has done is he's taken off the first letter B, um, so making it Adirazm, which he calls hate war because Adirazm, you know, Adel is to hate, and so when you take off the B, it gives you Adirazm, um, which is kind of like hate war, and then. The A at the end is just the Eastern Armenian colloquial variant of uh, to be. So like, um, um, like A is like is, right? Um, and so what, so putting that all together, uh, he's come up with it's hate war, uh, kind of all in one, all in one word like that. Yeah. And did anyone else have a question? Okay, well, let's okay. think. I think I saw something. Oh, in the yes, chat. yes. Oh, that's right. Oh, okay. go ahead. I was just going to say that I don't really have a question, but I just thought that it was the neatest book. I haven't seen any books like that that was written like with the walls and cutting yeah. out the figure. I think that's so cool. I'm so glad that you shared that with us, Arakel, because as a pharmacist, I would have never found that book, never read it, <laughs> never oh. heard about it. Yeah. So I just think that this is really, uh, it's so fascinating. I, I love I love that book. I'm so thankful that you shared it with us. And it's nice to know that there's people on both sides that were trying to make positive progress uh, mm -hmm. before the, the dictators and, and corrupt governments, um, you know, ruined everything. But thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, thank you, Siobhan. Thank you. And there's a um, Fatma Bulaz. Would you like to ask a question? Uh, you actually, it's not a question. It's more like uh, I wanted to share a recommendation. I will post sure. it in the chat. Uh, at the moment, I'm studying in Amsterdam at the uh, University of Amsterdam. And I, actually, I need to hand in a paper this Friday. And I chose the topic on uh, storytelling. Uh, so it's a bit late. I already brushed my teeth because I live in the <laughs> Netherlands, it's like 1 a.m. in the morning. Hence my cameras off, uh, but uh, yeah, I think like women are starting kind of a movement in the Caucasus. Uh, I think you, yeah, are, are, you know Chai Khane. Yeah, uh, my, yeah. my friend Wartui Balian, she made a very nice documentary, but I uh, mostly like the documentaries of uh, R. P. Bekarian. Uh, yeah, sorry for my typos. So I think uh, I also believe that within transitional justice that somehow women can play a role because I have the feeling that men, also the examples you gave were like from war and women mostly have lost either their brother, their loved ones, yeah. their fathers. So mm -hmm. they kind of, I don't know, this is my uh, feminine side talking mm -hmm. a little bit. They look a little bit different towards war. And yeah, yeah. I see kind of, I don't know how you think about it, that women can kind of start this whole reconciliation 
connection thing between the Armenians and Azerbaijanis. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you also did a kind of research on that. Um, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Fatma. Yeah, I've definitely, I've seen Arpi Bekarian's uh, essays and um, I really, I really like her point of view. Um, and, and I've seen Shaykhana's stuff as well and I, and I really love it. Um, I, I haven't done any research specifically on, um, on responses uh, from women, but I, I completely agree with you that such an important perspective um, and like brings a completely different perspective uh, to all of this. Um, and there, I mean, there is, there is one story I know of by um, someone named Susanna um, uh, oh, Harutyunan maybe, I, I don't remember, but anyways, it's actually from uh, the first war um, and um, and I think her work is really is really interesting as well. Um, so so yeah, th I mean, thank you so much for for talking about that. Uh, you're welcome. And as a, I think I will send an, a tr uh, a message through Instagram because I really want to read it. I've also have never seen such a book like uh, uh, sorry, I'm not I I cannot speak Armenian, but Garslian. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it looks really awesome and. Uh, and did you mention that it will be translated in Azerbaijani or? Uh, no. So the there there is one part at the end uh, that Garslian got uh, enlisted Alek Per Aliyev to translate into Azerbaijani, but the text itself, um, the whole text, I don't think will be. Uh, but he does have presentations in English um, on it, which which can be really helpful uh, if you don't speak Armenian. Okay, thank you so much. And if, yeah, and if you search his name, as Arakel said, or, or the book title, which yeah. you can find in the description of the talk on um, the website, yeah. whatever, then you can find on, on YouTube him presenting uh, the yeah. book, talking about it, showing it, then you can see even a little more. Yeah, I yeah. will do it. Thank you. Um, so I actually, I put in the chat, his his name on YouTube is is not spelled the way that I spell it, uh, but it's spelled that the way that I put it in the chat. Yeah, because I couldn't find it while you were giving the presentation. Yeah. I couldn't find any hits, thank you. Yeah, yeah, so it's I definitely would work because I, I couldn't go through the entire text. I don't even go through the entire text. Um, it's just like there's so much there, uh, but his presentations go through most of it um, and they're very interesting. Okay. I have a question. Oh, yes. And just keep it brief because we just have to end right now. So go ahead. Okay. Recently, I was watching Jeopardy and they had this question on it. What is the country, What which one is the country that is trying to take away Nagorno-Karabakh from Azerbaijan? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. We actually, we asked this question. Um, Maybe yeah. the, the it had cut out for you, but we we addressed this question earlier in the Q and A session. Thank um, you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Let's give a I guess silent round of applause <laughs> to Arakel. Thank you, everyone, so much for coming. I'm I'm glad that I mean there's so many people interested in this topic. Of course, of course, <laughs> and we hope to see you at a future Zohrab event and um, be well until then. Thank you.